NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, the world's first full-scale mission to test technology for defending Earth against potential asteroid or comet hazards, was launched on November 24 on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. The booster that launched DART into space returned to Earth just under nine minutes after launch, landing on a drone ship in the Pacific Ocean. The stage was on its third flight. Around 56 minutes after liftoff, the 610 kg DART spacecraft separated from the rocket's second stage, and about two hours later, the spacecraft completed the successful unfurling of its two 8.5 meters long rollout solar arrays. DART is a very simple and inexpensive metal box with two rollout extensible solar arrays and a single camera, manufactured and managed by the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Upon arrival, DART will impact a 160 meters diameter moonlet called Dimorphos that orbits around a much larger asteroid Didymos, 11 million kilometers from Earth. NASA predicts the crash will be strong enough to adjust Dimorphos' orbital period by a few minutes. The goal of the mission is to change the asteroid's motion in a way that can be accurately measured using ground-based telescopes. DART will show that a spacecraft can autonomously navigate to a target asteroid and intentionally collide with it, a method of deflection called kinetic impact. Lisha Cube, a CubeSat writing with DART and provided by the Italian Space Agency will be released prior to DART's impact to capture images of the impact and the resulting cloud of ejected matter. Roughly four years after DART's impact, ESA's HERA project will conduct detailed surveys of both asteroids, with particular focus on the crater left by DART's collision and a precise determination of Dimorpho's mass. The violent rendezvous is scheduled to occur in September 2022 at around 6.6 km per second. The results will inform future planetary protectors about how best to avoid or shield against a dangerous rock, something the dinosaurs could have used 66 million years ago. Russia's new docking module Pritchell successfully docked with the International Space Station on November 26. Launched atop a Soyuz rocket on November 24 with a modified Progress cargo spacecraft designed to deliver it to the space station, the four-ton Pritchell is a nodal module that has a pressurized spherical ball-shaped design with six hybrid docking ports. One of the six ports is active to allow docking with the space station, while the remaining five ports are passive, enabling other spacecraft to dock with the module. The interior of the module is divided into habitable and instrument zones and has a volume of 19 cubic meters. Following separation from the rocket's upper stage, Pritchell communicated down that all was well, and the module began a two-day rendezvous with the space station. With Pritchell successfully in orbit and healthy, the Progress MS-17 spacecraft undocked from the NACA module on Thursday to open up the port for Pritchell to connect. Pritchell propelled by Progress MM spacecraft then docked to the NACA Nader port on Friday using the automated KERS rendezvous system. To complete the integration of the Pritchell into the Russian segment, cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov will perform a spacewalk on 19 January 2022. The first spacecraft docking to Pritchell is planned to take place on 18 March 2022 with the Soyuz MS-21 mission. In addition to delivering Pritchell to the station, Progress MM also carried 700 kilograms of cargo, including expendable equipment, medical supplies, and food rations for the Expedition 66 crew. The Progress propulsion section is planned to remain docked at the station for 26 days. The propulsion section will then undock on December 21, revealing Pritchell's Nader docking port for future Russian spacecrafts. NASA has delayed the launch of its James Webb Space Telescope following an incident that affected its connection to the rocket. The incident occurred on November 9 during operations at the Satellite Preparation Facility in French Guiana, but NASA did not disclose it until November 22. Technicians were preparing to attach Webb to the launch vehicle adapter, which is used to integrate the observatory with the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket. A sudden unplanned release of a clamp band, which secures Webb to the launch vehicle adapter, caused a vibration throughout the observatory. Following the incident, a NASA-led anomaly review board was immediately convened to investigate and instituted additional testing. After days of investigation, on November 24, NASA announced that testing found no sign of damage to any of its components. Fueling of the telescope, the next major step in preparing the spacecraft for the launch began on November 25, and it will take about 10 days to complete. Due to this unexpected and unplanned incident, liftoff for Webb has now been delayed from December 18 to December 22. NASA's Mars Helicopter Ingenuity completed its 16th flight on November 21, about two weeks after its previous flight. The 1.8 kg robotic helicopter flew 116 meters northeast for 109 seconds, reaching a top speed of 1.5 meters per second and a maximum altitude of 10 meters. 
This flight is the second in a series of four to seven flights to return the helicopter to its original airstrip, dubbed Wright Brothers Field. Ingenuity's first four flights on Mars, way back in April, all began and ended from Wright Brothers Field. And as originally designed, the mission was not meant to do much more, but the chopper's early flights went so smoothly that NASA decided to extend its mission and send the little helicopter to scout out ahead of its larger companion, the Perseverance rover. While Ingenuity waits for the Perseverance rover to catch up to it following Flight 17, a flight software update could potentially be implemented to enable new navigation capabilities in preparation for future flights. Meanwhile, the Perseverance Mars rover, trundling on the surface of the Red Planet, has scooped the third and fourth samples to be analyzed and returned to Earth. The car-sized Perseverance rover drilled a core sample on November 15, and this third sample collected was different from the first two since it's loaded with a greenish mineral called olivine. Olivine is a magnesium iron silicate that makes up the majority of the Earth's upper mantle. The team behind the Perseverance rover has many hypotheses on how the olivine came up in the Martian rock. Olivine has been discovered in several unusual locations in space. The material was found in craters on the massive asteroid Vesta by NASA's Dawn spacecraft, and a fingerprint of olivine was discovered in a Martian soil sample by the Curiosity rover, investigating another region of Mars. The Perseverance rover is presently exploring the SETA area, where scientists believe the presence of unique rocks may reveal information about Mars' past and history of water presence. The fourth sample was collected on November 24, drilling another core from the same intriguing stone from which the third sample was collected. Perseverance has sealed five sample tubes to date, but one of those tubes is empty. The first rock the robot tried to sample back in August proved to be exceptionally soft, crumbling to bits that didn't make it into the designated titanium tube. The first two successful rock sample harvests by the Mars rover occurred in September, and both samples were obtained from a rock known as Rochette. Perseverance carries 43 sample tubes, 38 of which have been tasked to carry different samples from various geologic units and surface materials. These rock samples will be brought to Earth shortly, when NASA sends a spacecraft to recover them from Mars. The other five are witness tubes loaded with materials geared to capture molecular and particulate contaminants. The European Space Agency's Solar Orbiter has made its final Earth flyby on November 27, at 4.30 a.m. GMT, and is now on its way to the next closed pass of the Sun. During this Earth flyby, the spacecraft was at its closest approach, just 460 kilometers above sea level. The flyby was essential to decrease the spacecraft's energy and line it up for its next close pass of the Sun. According to the European Space Agency, this maneuver was the riskiest flyby yet for a science mission, as the spacecraft passed through the clouds of space debris around Earth. Launched in February 2020, Solar Orbiter is a space mission of international collaboration between ESA and NASA, which will study the connection between the Sun and the Earth and also address big questions in solar system science. During its mission, Solar Orbiter will use a combination of 10 remote sensing and in-situ instruments that will operate continuously to observe the turbulent solar surface features. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Although no significant tests on Starship 20 and Booster 4 have taken place in the last two weeks, SpaceX appears to have started tying up a few loose ends at Starship's orbital launch site, potentially paving the way for the orbital test flight, which could take place as early as January 2022. Recently, in a virtual conference, Elon Musk said that the orbital launch site would be completed by the end of November, and the launch site is now starting to show some signs of that. SpaceX has made significant progress on the Starship Quick Disconnect arm last week, practically completing it in the last few days. SpaceX employees completed the arm's plumbing two weeks ago, which required thousands of meters of insulated steel tubes connecting to the pad's propellant tanks. On November 23, SpaceX mounted the final major component of the arm, the actual quick disconnect mechanism that will connect to Starship to supply power, communications, and propellant. When a rocket is on its launch pad, a quick disconnect mechanism or the umbilicals allow the flow of liquids, gases, electric power, and signals to the spacecraft. The umbilical is detached from the spacecraft at or before liftoff and will swing away from the vehicle to allow the craft to move unimpeded. Let's take a look at the main ports and connections on the Starship Quick Disconnect Arm mechanism, with the help of this higher-resolution image from the Starship Gazer. The two big ports in the center are the liquid oxygen and liquid methane fill and drain ports. Four ball joints are used to align and lock the QD mechanism at the tower side and the QD panel at the ship side. A similar system was used in the Saturn V rocket, which can be remotely disengaged by pneumatic actuation as well as a mechanical device. 
The quick disconnect mechanism will be secured to the ship's quick disconnect panel by eight locking hooks. The command to activate or disarm the flight termination system is sent through a port labeled FTS inductive inhibit. Fill and drain ports for gaseous nitrogen transfer gaseous nitrogen into and out of the ship. The high voltage connection port is located next to it. The bottom two ports are labeled methane ground bleed and interstage purge, and on top, we have liquid oxygen and liquid methane pre-press. If you know what these connections are for, please let me know in the comments section because I couldn't find any information on them. The QD arm can also swing left and right to quickly back away during launches and make room for the booster catching arms during rocket catches and stacking operations. A few minor actuators will almost certainly need to be fitted, and the QD mechanism will need to be properly connected to the launch pad systems to complete the works on the mechanism, but the QD arm currently appears to be nearly complete and should be ready to feed starships mounted on top of super heavy rockets soon. However, SpaceX hasn't finished installing the booster catching arms that will lift the ship and the booster up and down the tower. Scaffolding around the tower's legs still needs to be removed, and the draw works must be fully functional before the catching arms can freely roll up and down the rails welded to the tower's exteriors. The catching arm assembly's first real move is likely to happen in the coming weeks. Last week, SpaceX tested the orbital launch pad's launch mount, the giant steel structure that will hold the super heavy booster down during testing and before liftoff. SpaceX executed the first of these experiments on November 21, releasing an unknown gas from the mount. It was the first simultaneous test of all 20 of the mount's Raptor boost engine gas supplies, which, having no need to reignite in flight, will rely on ground gas supplies for ignition. Each of Super Heavy's 20 outer Raptor engines is equipped with a tiny umbilical and quick disconnect mechanism, resulting in the most mechanically complex rocket launch station ever created. A similar gas venting test was again conducted on Friday, November 26. The booster quick disconnect panel on the orbital launch mount triggered on November 22, demonstrating how it will move forward to attach to Super Heavy after a booster is installed on the launch mount. The QD panel will also need to rapidly shift away from Super Heavy right before liftoff to avoid its sensitive components being practically incinerated during launch. Aside from avoiding direct impingement from the thousands degree plume created by Raptor engines at full thrust, that movement will also tie into some kind of hood, seamlessly actuating hatches that will close to truly protect the mechanism. That hood was sighted for the first time on November 21, and it will most likely be mounted on the launch mount soon. Furthermore, during the last week or two, SpaceX has begun installing pipings for the water deluge system to help manage the severe thermal and sonic conditions created by the world's most powerful rocket during liftoff. Pre-launch work on the Starship 20 is in progress, and workers began installing aero covers on the ship's electrical and hydraulic lines. Thermal protection system tile installation on Ship 21's nose cone is nearing completion. The nose cone will soon be stacked atop the propellant tank section of Ship 21, which is currently located inside the midbay. Currently, five ships and four boosters are being built at Starbase, each at various stages of construction. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.